hello to, to, to the, the attendees. Um, so um, oh, what we're going to do today is, is basically, it's the um, exercise portion of the, um, of, of the training. So you'll take what you, you had a chance to kind of see in action yesterday and um, try it out for yourself. Now, there's three parts to this exercise. Um, the first part, <clears throat> Um, you'll recognize from the previous day's tutorial, um, which is, you know, loading up this new MNIST data set, um, exploring it, massaging it a little bit, and, um, and, um, and also kind of visualizing it using PCA and, and TISNI. And I think you'll find that one a little bit more interesting. And that'll be the, the, the first third. Um, then the middle third, um, which will give you a little less time, like 15 to 20 minutes for you to do, is where you get to create your own model yourself. And so basically it's, it's a chance to, um, you know, attest your uh, knowledge and what you've picked up from the tutorials previously. And um, and also to experiment with some different different things, some different um, hyperparameters, maybe a different optimizer, and just to, to get a sense, this is a smaller data set and it should train faster. Um, and um, the you know, you'll, you'll see how that goes. The, the final third, which um, which will uh, do is has to do with um, a a Kaggle um, a, a contest, and it's the the digit recognizer contest. Um, so Kaggle is a, um, a Google supported owned. Um, community for data scientists that hosts a variety of resources, including um, competitions and data sets and examples. And it's a way for the community to kind of share their knowledge uh, for uh, machine learning um, and, um, and challenge each other to, to improve their models. And so one of the con contests that they have that's kind of always running is um, the digit recognizer, which uses a very famous MNIST uh, digit uh, database. Uh, basically, this database was, uh, I believe, created originally to help with automatically reading, you know, postal codes and addresses and, and the, the numbers on the postal codes in, in the U.S. Or I guess, and there, there they're called zip codes you know, to candidates' postal codes. So it's to, to read read the zip codes. And um, of course, you know, when people write them, all sorts of different styles and of, of you know with, with the right letters and if you want to create an automatic system to recognize them it helps to have lots of, of data and that's where that data set came from originally and so we're going to uh, use it instead of the c410 data set uh, which so the number of categories is the same but now they're digits zero to nine and uh, so what i'm going to have you do is in the um in the chat, I'm going to pass along this link, which is the link to the um, <clears throat> to the tutorial, and I'm also going to pass along the link to the exercise. Give me one second here. So we're, today we will be doing the exercise. <clears throat> so hello to the attendees. This is good. We now we now have um, some more. So. Um, so there's a link there um, that um, uh, if you open it up, I'm going to go and share my screen now. Um, we're going to open it up in, in CoLab. So give me a second here. OK, so uh, what you should now see is, is basically the repository. And, um, and I'm going to go to the basically where I have loaded it. Um, in 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 um, um, in uh, um, ca in in collab, <clears throat> so you can tell you're the right one if it says deep learning exercise with MNIST and Keras. Okay, so um, so if you do have a problem, please make like like you if if your collab isn't up right now, you know, please let us know in the Q and A, which I think is the, is the only. Um, interaction you have. I don't think that you can actually put anything in the chat. So um, one of the issues today, by the way, just for, for the attendees, is that um, we're running this Zoom session as a webinar. Um, so there's some 
interactive capabilities that were missing, like the ability for breakout rooms and for you to share screens. Um, so um, if you get stuck, like really stuck, and you, we have to kind of work something through with you later on, um, we'll find some other way, maybe send you like a different link um, that you can kind of go to briefly. Um, or, but, but for now, we'll try to, you know, you, you put your questions in the Q&A and, and um, uh, David Poog, who's a data scientist at KBL, uh, will be around to, to, to help you. Um, so just as last time, as yesterday, uh, we want to make sure that our collab session is, our, um, the runtime is going to use a GPU. So we're going to go down to runtime, change runtime type, and for the hardware accelerator, we're going to specify GPU, okay? And then I'm going to save. So, um, um, let me see here. And uh, what I see, you know, up here is that I haven't yet really connected to the uh, Jupyter kernel, so it hasn't really launched yet. But as soon as I start running some code, it, it, it will launch. So let's try this first um, cell. So we remember that, I think it was um, shift enter for Mac and Windows or, okay, uh, uh, yes. And of course run anyway. Yes, we will run it anyway. And it's gonna st start a, um, a Jupyter kernel in the background, which is gonna basically have our a running Python, and you can see actually up in the corner, it says initializing, and there it's connected. And now it runs, and well, it, it doesn't say anything, but it did work. Um, so similar to last time, we're going to kind of try to load our, our data set again using um, um, using um, uh, Keras's um, load data set functionality, uh, but there's some helper functions here we don't have to worry about. Uh, they're just for um, uh, uh, different ways that we could kind of load and verify that we have the data and, and the models. And the first thing we'll do is, perfect. So if, if we see that the downloading from Google APIs, Keras, uh, the MNIST, <clears throat> that's good. Okay. <clears throat> so at this point here, could I verify that people have actually seen downloading data and um, have the data there? So if, if, um, if you don't, please in this Q&A said not yet or whatever, and if you've got it, please maybe just say, yep, and I'll go and check the chat. Cool. So <clears throat> looks like We've got it. Let's go to the next step. Again, like last time, we're going to you know import a bunch of um, system and Python libraries, pandas and numpy and matplotlib. So um, we were familiar with numpy um, and matplotlib previously, um, which so numpy was kind of a Python math library, very ubiquitous in the data sciences. And we used that basically our, our data sets previously were in kind of numpy array formats. Um, and we use matplotlib to do the plotting and all nice kind of graphs and so on. Um, we're also going to use uh, a, uh, a data science tool called Pandas this time, which um, lets us kind of work with table format data and CSV data, and which we will need later on when we submit to, to Kaggle and, and use their version of the data set. So let's run um, this, these imports that worked. We'll load up. TensorFlow and Keras, just as we did last time. We'll also set matplotlib to be in line so that we basically get the graphs showing um, immediately afterwards. And we're just gonna verify here that we actually do have you know, a GPU and this is kind of what our environment is set up as. And we see, yes, we're in Colab, you know, decent version, new versions of TensorFlow and, and Python. And yes, the important part, we do have a physical GPU. So um, if, You've got that, we're good. It's kind of, kind of like yesterday. Uh, if you don't, you might, you'll have to go back to the beginning and um, change the runtime to GPU and then restart the kernel um, and then get this. And so if you are, um, uh, don't have a GPU and have to catch up, just let, let us know. Um, so.
So actually, we've already downloaded the data set. It's here. Um, the data set's quite small. We're going to load it entirely in memory. Um, and um, we're going to have to you know, start exploring it. And this can see a little bit about what its shape is and so on. Um, so um, let's just run our, our cache, make sure it's there. Um, ignore, ignore the failed. But if we run the find, we find it. So that it's in our, in our Keras data sets directory. And similar to before, I'm going to create some helper functions, um, basically turning um, the index label into the index into labels. Well, in this case, um, you know, so yesterday the the label values were like you know zero to nine, but what they represented was things like automobiles and cats and dogs and deers. Um, but in this case, zero to nine represents zero to nine. So I'm just going to basically just say convert it to an int just to be sure. And then I'm going to basically um, have these other helper functions that let us pull out um, the label values um, from you know, a different sorts of, um, of, of, of array or outputs that we can get. And they just get used in the code later on. So we'll run that. So these are just helper functions. And okay, just ignore that one. That, that's, um, double check that it's there. Okay, now we're going to try to, to load it. And no complaints. And basically, similar to yesterday when we had like the CIFAR 10 load data, and we basically created, we returned two tuples. Each tuple was, the, the first tuple was the training data set, and then the second tuple was the test data set. Um, and then the data sets themselves are split into two parts. There's the uh, the input, the X values, and then there's the Y labels uh, output. And what we're trying to do is basically uh, learn um, how, how to basically uh, calculate Y values from X values. So it's basically creating a complex function. Um, this second one, uh, the second cell, if I run it, um, just tries, you know, just, just verifies the data is there, and if not, tries a second data source. But in this case, data is loaded, so we're good. And similar to last time, we're going to just try to explore that data, find out what its types are, its sizes are, its shape is. And so we see that, that their training data set, it's um, um, NumPy arrays, just as yesterday. We see that the... Um, that the a data type for the um, X is unsigned int A, similar to yesterday. Um, so, you know, integer values from 0 to 255. Um, say, same for the Y. Um, of course, we don't use all of those. Uh, we also see the shape. And so we see that we have 60,000 examples, but there's a little something difference about the shape of each of the image. Um, it's actually, uh, 28 by 28 instead of 32 by 32. And it, because it's grayscale, um, th there is only one dimension. And we don't, it actually doesn't show up here as part of that shape. So it's actually a two dimensional shape. Uh, whereas um, we, when we deal with images, you know, when we have like red, green, blue in the different channels, that would be three dimensional. And so um, we sometimes have to convert from this two dimensional into a three dimensional. Uh, with kind of like a, a dummy color dimension uh, to make things like matplotlib happy and, and the networks of them, themselves. But we'll, we'll see what, what happens with that. Um, we also see that the Y train shape is basically, um, you know, the same number of examples. Um, and similar with the, the, the test shapes, um, we see that there's only 10,000 examples, but the, the size of the images there is the same. Um, so let's kind of get a sense of what the min, max, the range of these values is. And if we run this cell, we see that the, um, on the, the X values, the, the min and max, well, you know, zero, black, 255, white. Um, interestingly, the, the, the mean value is, is not quite in the middle of those like last time. Um, so that kind of means that there's a lot more darker space. So as we'll see why shortly. And for the, for the 
the, tra the tra trading labels, uh, we see that uh, basically they're going to just use the numbers from zero to nine. So that's the maximum. Um, I'm going to create some helper functions here. One of them is to convert to this two image. Uh, basically helps to reshape the um, the arrays that we get um, to, to make them to kind of give us this dummy third dimension and um, um, to make you know the, the network the input happy and to make matplotlib happy as well so and uh, and then of course we'll have the ability to kind of plot uh, a bunch of, of these images and now we're going to basically see what the training set looks like. Ta-da. Okay, let me just check this. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll let you do that, but um, okay, perfect. Uh, so I'll let you do that, and, um, but I'll still go, go ahead and there'll be like a, a, a pause in the middle where you know, you'll be able to catch up. So awesome, okay, thank you very much, that's good. Okay, <clears throat> so where were we here? Okay, we've been exploring the data set. Okay, and we got, we, we kind of plotted it out so that we can actually see what it looks like. And you can get a sense of the variety of um, uh, images. You can you know, certainly see, let's, let's look if we can find some interesting things here. Um, of course, you know, sevens, there's a lot of different ways to, to do sevens. Uh, someone put a little um, serif at the end of this one. This five, well, there's hardly a loop at the bottom. <clears throat> um, let's see what else. There. This, oh yeah. So this is a, this is a nine, although it could be a G, but it's a nine, and you compare it to a nine like this. And um, there's this three here, you know, it almost almost closes up. <clears throat> you could almost think of it like maybe a sloppy eight that could be, you know, an, an issue for the recognizer. But that gives you kind of a sense of, of what that data set uh, looks like. Um, let's go in and plot the histograms as we have uh, previously. <clears throat> and that first, so that, that basically that we defined the histogram plot. And now we're going to look at the values that we get. So <clears throat> what we see is that um, the um, uh, the number of, of, of samples that we have for each of the categories varies a little bit. So like we have more examples of ones than we do, for example, of, of, um, of fives. But it's, it's not terribly bad. Like yesterday, the data set was everything was the same, but this is still 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 reasonable. The other interesting thing about the, about the histogram is that uh, you see there's a lot of blacks. That's kind of the major one. And then most of the other colors or the grays are kind of, you know, kind of bright white grays, which kind of, you know, matches our, what we see here. Yes, you know, you see kind of gray around the edges of this thing, but mostly a lot of black and a little bit of kind of very, very bright colors. So the other thing that we have to do is you just verify that our test set uh, matches our, our data set. And so we're gonna run this on the, on the test set and we see uh, basically similar looking histograms. Um, but the, uh, David had, had mentioned uh, yesterday, another interesting thing that we could do is we could actually compare the histograms and the, and the data distributions per category, just to make sure that at the category level, they were kind of matching up. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go and kind of, so we're trying to, we're trying to make a function basically that, you know, given some X, which is an image, uh, can we produce a Y, which is the digit? And um, so we have a representation for the images in this 28 by 28 um, image space. And um, we would kind of maybe want to get a sense of, you know, how close is this original representation to the final one? Can we kind of find interesting clusters? And we're going to use the PCA analysis that we did yesterday, uh, but we're going to run it uh, on this data set instead. <clears throat> so we have calculated 
the PCA features. <clears throat> We're gonna um, create, define our, our, our plot function. And now we're going to take our first kind of look. So these are the uh, components of the PCA analysis. And remember how yesterday, as you, so remember our discussion yesterday about, you know, this is an alternate representation. Basically, you've changed the basis uh, uh, dimensions um, for the um, representational space, um, starting with the one that has the most variance. And you can basically, in this space, you can use this vector space to, to represent any of the images that you saw previously. But the neat thing about this is that the further along, um, uh, so the, the, um, the further uh, along we get with the components, that the, 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 the initial components are kind of the most important features that, um, to creating the images. As we get to, as we um, continue to the higher components, they have basically represent more details. And at some point, we could actually kind of cut those details off and still be close enough. Um, but we see here is that probably the most important thing going on is kind of this overall, you know, round shape. Things like zeros and and eights have this, and <clears throat> even things like maybe fives and nines and, and threes, for example, they, you know, um, they may not be fully rounded, but they may, they have this, and then you can maybe remove some of the, the missing pieces. And then we see things, we start to see things like, um, um, maybe things that sound, look a little bit like the nine, but remove some of these other areas, or things that look, that, that um, uh, kind of threes and, and we, we start to see kind of the, the, the kind of primary shapes. And then as we kind of continue along looking at the, the, um, the components, the higher we go, um, the kind of the less information that they bring and the more details that they add um, to, to our representation. Let's look, if we do a scatter plot of the, the, of the first two major components, um, what, do, do, what, do, do, what do we get? So, I'm just going to create our, our helper functions. We're doing the plot for 3D and 2D. And let's try to visualize that. OK. <clears throat> so <clears throat> interestingly, um, you know, we still see overlap in the same way that we did uh, previously. So we're looking at basically <clears throat> just among these, these first two dimensions, which are kind of the, the, the two major dimensions, um, and we're kind of taking this data set and compressing it down into two dimensions using these principal components, just the first two. And we see that, yeah, to some degree, it kind of separates. Certainly ones seem to be quite by themselves. Um, and we see like, so red, that would be like the threes, uh, kind of in this area. Um, and then here, like seven, nine, um, what else do we have in this area? zeros kind of in, in this area you know they're not completely separated but they're starting to let's um let's look at a 3d plot for that and um basically adds one more extra component dimension to this and um you can kind of see the start of a separation and in, into, into into categories so um you know in this rep representational space, we wouldn't be able to like, you know, cut a nice line or plane through it and 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 section out the, the categories of interest. Um, but we see that it's not quite as complex as the um, the image uh, data set that we were looking at yesterday. Let's see what Tisney provides. So remember that <coughs> Tisney um, <coughs> separated the. Um, um, basically looked for locality based on your neighbors as opposed to just raw distance in that dimensional space. And um, so um, again, Tisney a little bit slower. So we're only going to sample 10% of the original space. Um, and then we're going to try to create our embedding from this. Hey, Glendon. Yes. Yeah. So just while this is while Tisney is running, so one of the things with um, that I've found with the MNIST data sets because they have um, 
you know, white letters on a black background. Mm -hmm. um, a good way to make sure that your model is actually learning to identify the digits and not learning just the aggressive contrast between black background and white uh, digit is to actually create extra training data by reversing the um, the, the contrast to have it be a, a black digit on a white background and maybe even throw in some like rotations or uh, or things like that to create more training data. It's something that works really well on MNIST and, and, and other um, on other classification problems as well. Cool, awesome. So actually that's kind of interesting because um, you know uh, when we get in, get involved other uh, thanks David. So you know when when you get the, the data set that um, that Kaggle provides, um, it isn't complete, and then they in fact don't give the um, don't give a, a test set either. Um, so uh, we're going to reuse ours later on just to kind of get a sense of of how our model trained on their data. But um, so a David's suggestion to basically uh, augment the, the data in a variety of interesting ways, like you know, reversing it and um, tweaking it by little rotations or you know, little bits of scaling um, is an interesting way to, um, to basically improve the generality of the final model that, that we'll train. So that, that's cool, thank you. Um, so now let's go and see what Tisney tells us about our data. And I think this is this is kind of cool, actually. So, <clears throat> using simply, simply from the image space in, in that you know, um, almost you know, nine hundred dimensional space, um, a pixel space, <clears throat> using simply um, looking at kind of nearest neighbors and trying to preserve that um, the the, um, the neighborhood relationships, <clears throat> we can actually start to pull out the the um, categories quite nicely um, we can cert we can certainly kind of like you know draw little circles around that maybe cut them by by planes um, so we you know we would have like for example to separate what is this the five from the three so interestingly you know the five has that loop at the bottom kind of like the three does um, you know we would maybe have to um, it, it's not like a single plane, but you can kind of see how you can kind of separate out even this just 2D space, um, the, the, the categories uh, uh, kind of fall out from that. Now, Tisney is purely for visualization. If you ran this again, you know, the clusters might show up in, 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 different, uh, in different regions, but it kind of gives us a sense of the complexity of this data set or its simplicity. Um, so I'm gonna skip over the 3D one, you can try running it later on your own. Um, um, but um, just for, to, for to, to, to get to where we need to be, um, I'm going to skip ahead to the data conversion. So remember that last time the data set was in, you know, uint, and we want to end in the, from 0 to 255. And we had the categories encoded as numbers, um, but we wanted to turn those labels into one hot encodings. Um, that's basically what's happening here. So um, the first thing we're going to do is basically figure out the number of classes, which we kind of do based off of the min and the max of the, the training set. Uh, we all, and so then we create the one hot encodings using uh, the Keras utilities to categorical. Um, and then um, we're going to reshape the, um, the, the training and the test data. And, um, and, and the reason for that is uh, we want to add that extra uh, dimension. Basically, it's, it's like that dummy third dimension um, just to, to make the, the network happy. And, and the, um, um, so let's run those. So 10 classes as we expected. And now we've basically reshaped it from two dimensional images to three dimensional. We're now going to normalize it into uh, going from, um, we want it to go uh, in a zero to one range instead of a zero to 255 range. So here's the normalization step. 
and we're going to look at so now the uh, data types are floats um, and um, the, the uh, uh, arrays are now three-dimensional images even if that color dimension only has one dimension um, and the training data for both uh, and so that the labels for both train and test uh, are now one hot encoded, so they, they're of size 10. <clears throat> so let's go and just, um, we're now getting to the part where we're going to create our model, but before then, we want to just define our helper functions for doing the, pl the, the plots. Okay, and now this part here, we're now at create your own classifier. So there's a bunch of to-dos in this cell. Um, you see the hyperparameters, which, you know, I've just put some values in there. You can fiddle around with those if you'd like. Um, and um, there's also, you can create your model so that there's the function that we'll call. And so I've started out with a sequential model. So you remember that that was the very simple one from yesterday that <clears throat> forms one layer after another. And we can simply go model add and then whatever new layer that, that we need. Um, so you can create your, your model here. Um, so <clears throat> you can, you know, look at the notebook from yesterday. And let me just go and I'll just put a link to, to that notebook. This is the tutorial notebook. And you can you can view it on GitHub. Actually, let me see. Yeah. So I'll put this in the chat. <clears throat> um, so this is the this is the notebook. It's not completed. It's not running in, in CoLab. You can't run it, but you can kind of see the previous examples and maybe use that for some inspiration. Um, and um, so yes, yeah, so you'll basically create your model here. Uh, we also <clears throat> have a function to create your compiled model, and what it does is it calls the create my model function to create the model. And then you're gonna to have to add some, you know, model compile code there. So that was the code that basically turned the description of your model, which was a description of layer after layer after layer. Um, typically like, you know, the weights layer, uh, the, the layer type, then the activation weights, activation, that sort of thing. Um, and then it compiles it into whatever backend, in this case, TensorFlow. And at this point, you also specify what sort of optimizer uh, you want to use as well. And what I have done is I've also included Atom here. Previously, we just you tried RMS prop. Um, Atom is another um, um, momentum-based optimizer kind of in the family um, and has some nice, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, easy to use, fairly performant um, optimizer as well. So if you add these codes in, um, then what will happen is that once you're done there, you can basically go ahead and run these other um, cells. This cell here will basically create your um, compiled model. It'll print out a summary for you so you can see what layers are there and, and how, how many weights you have to train. Um, and then this cell will actually do a, a, a run, uh, run the training. Um, we're passing in the, um, the training data and the labels, uh, our batch size, our epochs, <clears throat> and the validation data set, and similar to previous yesterday. And then you can plot out the history of how it performs over each epoch and, and plot some of the predictions. And so what I'll do is I will give you, give you like 15 minutes to kind of try that out. Um, and what we'll do is we'll come back at, uh, at 10 o'clock and, um, and then start on the, the, the Kaggle, the Kaggle exercise part. And I'll walk you uh, through that. Um, so I'll, I'll let you go until, till 10 o'clock 
Uh, if you do have questions or encounter issues or whatever, um, please you know leave a, a message in a, a question or you know because all of you can talk, you can just um, open up your mic and, and, and ask as well. So I'll, I'll let you experiment with that for now, and um, and then I will be back at ten. Okay, <laughs> hello everyone. Um, so how's it going? Do we able to? Get a working example. So if you may just put it in the Q and A, you know, if you're, um, we're able to get something working, um, that would be great. And what we'll do is we'll just kind of continue. I'll show you what I did. <clears throat> so um, the, I basically copied some of the code from the previous day's session, and it worked as is. Um, so I created that simple convolutional um, neural network that we had previously. That was our second network, but the first complete one that was kind of all made by us and, and trained from, from scratch. Um, and so that basically that code basically I filled in here. And um, and then for the um, the compile, I basically used the previous example. That we had seen um, the, the the previous example that we had seen. <clears throat> Let me just double check chat. <clears throat> and um, I just I, I used the same um, optimizer that we had used previously as well, um, and that was the only changes that I made to to that cell. And then I ran the, the next cells. I see my summary that the, uh, the network looks similar to the one yesterday, that it has about um, just under a million um, total parameters. Um, and I then trained it. Um, the number of epochs that we trained over, at least by default, was only 12. Um, and we see uh, basically you know, it's pretty quick, but very quickly, the network kind of converges to near 100% accuracy, like 0.9938. So, and and the loss. So basically, the loss in both the test and the, the, the training and the test, very similar. So you know we have generalized well. Our accuracy is great. <clears throat> awesome network, uh, and we can evaluate a little bit um, the predictions. You know, has done a great job here. Um, the, the uh, and in my case, it got all the all these correct. Um, the if we look at the classifier probabilities, we see that the certainty levels uh, that it has basically for which category the uh, the x data is in very high. There's no there's no doubt there. Remember yesterday's example, you know, even when it got the correct answer, sometimes it wasn't quite sure if it could be some other category. And here we have you know, a high degree of, of certainty as well in these examples. So with that, we're now ready to begin with um, uh, competing in the Kaggle um, digit recognizer competition. So <clears throat> the first thing is to get a Kaggle account. Now the cool thing is that Kaggle, I think it's owned by Google, and you can log in using your Google credentials. So let's go and um, so I, I've already logged in, but if, if you were to click on this link here, um, you would have an option of using your Google credentials and, um, and um, so you can just log in with Google, your, your Google account directly. So because in your collab, you are probably running within a um, um, within your Google account. Um, then, when you click on that link, um, you should already be logged into into Google. So, <clears throat> what I'd like you to do is uh, log in to um, to Kaggle um, using either your previous credentials or just use your Google Google account um, and. If you could let me know, we'll give you like just a few minutes to, to do that. And if you could let me know um, when you are successfully into that account, and I'll show you what that screen should look like. Basically, 
but with, with your name instead of mine. Um, the important thing is going to be at the top right-hand corner, this little goose. Um, the important thing is that your account information is here. And in a moment, after you've logged in, it will want to go to your profile and create keys. So I'm going to um, leave that uh, up for a second. I'm, I'm going to sign in here. And I can, I can sign in with Google. Boom, uh, I'm back. So <clears throat> hopefully um, you are now here. I'm going to assume I haven't heard nay or yay. Um, so I'll assume that you're in. Um, let's talk about the next thing that, that we need. So we need to, to um, so we want to communicate from this notebook with Kaggle, uh, with, with Kaggle. I can pronounce that in a funny way. So with, with Kaggle. Um, and to do this, um, we need to get API credentials. And so basically it's going to be like a username and a key. And so the great thing about the key is that it's going to let you access your account but um, it's temporary like, because you don't want to put your actual credentials in here because then, um, you know, um, if you, for example, save this notebook somewhere on the web, someone else could come along and just look at it. But with your credentials, but with these API credentials, which are temporary, you can basically create them and then revoke them. And um, <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do. So we're going to go to the account tab. Um, and then go to the user profile and create new uh, API token from the API section. So here's what we're going to do. So in Kaggle, we go to this top right-hand section where we can go to our um, information, our content information. We go to your profile. And we now get this sc screen right here. <clears throat> the important bit is I think, account. Perfect. So if you click on account here, you will scroll down and you can go click on the API section. So if you click on uh, create new API token, it will download a, a file called um, a, a, a JSON, so, so a Kaggle.json. And that is just a text file. <clears throat> so um, what you can do is, um, so here I'm on the Mac. Um, so it wants to open it up in, for, for me, it wants to open it up in, um, uh, what does it want to open up in? It wants to open up in Xcode. No, thank you. Text edit is, is a perfect app to open it up in. And what you're going to see is, um, there's a little bit of text. It's in JSON format, which is JavaScript object uh, format. And it's like kind of like a key value pairs. Um, and so you see, you know, the key is username, and then there's a value in quotes. And then there's key as a, um, the, the key as key in quotes. And then the value is a whole bunch of letters and digits. Everyone should be different. Okay. And what we're going to do is you're going to need to copy and paste these values into here. So let me show you where, um, where, where you will do that. So you see in this cell right here, um, it's a bash cell. And basically you're gonna run, uh, there's a, a Kaggle command um, installed in, um, uh, in uh, Google, Google Colab, which lets you kind of interact with uh, Kaggle and the competitions. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically download from the digit recognizer competition, the data set. But to do that, you have to do it as yourself. And so what you need to do is you need to take this, this part here where it says you, your username, and you need to copy out the username value from that JSON file and put it in here in your notebook. And then the part that says your API key, you will copy out the value that was in that JSON file for the key. So it would look like a whole bunch of letters and digits and numbers, right? Um, once you've done that, and you'll need the quotation marks around them, um, you can then just run this cell. And what will happen is you will get something like this, where it says downloading um, sample submission to a particular directory. 
Uh, um, and then afterwards, you can run this cell, which basically, um, because it downloads a zip file and you want to extract that zip to get the different CSV files that are in there. So CSV, comma, separated values, um, kind of a standard kind of text-based format for, for table, tabular data. So um, if you could let me know if you, um, in the chat, actually, um, sorry, in the Q&A, um, if you, if you um, succeed here, if you're able to get to the part where it extracts the archive and you see something like this here, um, uh, please let me know. And if you're stuck with something, um, if you could also maybe put that in the Q&A. So I'll just wait for a few minutes to, um, and you can, you can also, you know, um, unmute and just ask questions and um, run this, um, this cell and you would get code similar to this. And then afterwards you'd run the cell to extract the data. Now there's, um, there's another cell that you can run afterwards. You can run this one here. So it downloads the data from an alternate place. Um, or th this is just a helper function to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Run this, make sure it's cached and available and the, and the data is in the right place. And now we're ready to submit to, to, to Kaggle. So if you're not ready for this, um, you know, just please say, um, hold on in the Q&A or, or unmute and ask for some help. But if not, we're gonna go ahead. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, to explore this data set. So <clears throat> the first thing is that this data set is, um, this data set is in CSV format. Um, and so this in CSV format, comma separated values, the first line, so it's text-based, that first line is the kind of the labels. And here we see um, the labels for the columns. And so the first label, column one, is the label, which is actually kind of the, um, the, 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 the head values. So it's the, it's the, um, the, the category values. Let me just print out a few more, more lines here instead. Print out five lines instead. Okay, so, um, so here we see that, um, So this head command is, 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 is it's a bash command. And it just lets us look at like the, in this case, the first five lines of the file. You see the first one is the column labels and very inefficiently it's, you know, every pixel um, up to 768 or whatever it is, is has a name um, and then it has a number. It's, it's all text. And <clears throat> we see that the first column is the uh, label so that, that first column, at least for the, the training data, is the label, the category that this um, image is, is in. Now, notice that the test data does not have this. So, you know, previously, we our our uh, test set had the labels, and that's how we we determined for ourselves what our accuracy was, how well we had generalized. Um, but this one doesn't because. Um, we are going to uh, submit uh, uh, um, what we think the values are, and then um, Kaggle is going to is going to basically do the evaluation for us because it knows what these are. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use pandas to read the data in uh, as a table, and we're going to do that for the training set. So you can just run this, let's see what, how long it takes. Okay. And we can do this for, for the test set as well. So, um, and we can, we can kind of see this kind of this nicer view of it, but um, yeah. And we see how, how big it is. Um, so the, so remember that our, our original MNIST training set had like 60,000 uh, training examples. Here we only have like 42, this is a little under 42,000. And, um, and the 785 columns, well, one of them is for the label 
and 784 for the um, uh, the image data, and 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 there's our our, 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 our uh, test set. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually load these into um, into into variables for uh, the features, um, the labels, so so the, the, the training features, uh, which is like the X, and then the training labels, that's like the Y. <clears throat> and what I've done here is I have um, um, so basically, you know, I'm reading in the train CSV in both cases, but I, I'm able to specify which columns I want to bring in. Um, and I'm also going to tell it to convert um, that the data type is basically going to, going to be a uint8, and then I'm going to convert the whole thing into a numpy array. Okay, so that's a little bit of extra bit of magic that means that this underscore train features and labels and features are going to be numpy arrays, not pandas tables. Right. So now we're back into the land of numpy and um, which is kind of where we were previously, and we're ready to go explore our data set just a little bit. Um, so again, we see the numpy arrays. We see that the data type is, is uh, integer as before. We see the shapes. And again, the shapes are a little bit different here. Um, so remember that our, um, our model wanted to see 28 by 28 by one. And these are to single dimensions, just a, just a flat array. Um, but we're, we're going to fix that. So I'm going to print out some information about them. <clears throat> Similar to before, you know, the range of values looks reasonable for both the, the train and the test. Um, the labels, same sort of range. Um, we're going to plot these. So uh, that plot helper function that we defined earlier to convert from the different uh, image types it was designed to kind of handle this case where we had like a flat array and needed to turn it into um, a three-dimensional array. And so, yeah, you know, it looks the same as before. Histogram plot, just to be on the same side. Yeah, looks just the same as before. We don't, we don't do one for the test set because we don't have the Y data, we don't have the label data uh, there. So we're gonna convert just as before. Number of classes is still 10. Uh, run the next cell. Uh, we see what the shapes are, but we're now going to we now see we've done the reshape. Okay, so there is so train features that's a numpy array. Reshape is a, a, a numpy a method, and um, and we're going to reshape into this at this size. We're also going to normalize the, the feature data that the, the training features, um, and just to see what that looks like. We now. Um, you know, is there now floats and they're in the range zero to one. So let's go and create our model. We're going to use the same model that we, we just uh, built. So model is what we had created uh, previously. We're going to uh, evaluate it on this new data. Okay, so this is our old model, but with the new data, which you know, we kind of should expect very similar results because it's pretty much this, from the same data set. Um, although it's been kind of distributed a little differently between training and test. Um, we can look at some predictions. And again, 100% correct. The prediction plots. Again, as we expect, because this data really is pretty much the same. So, um, so here's where we can modify the hyperparameters as we need. Um, I, I'm not going to, to do that. Um, I'm going to basically stick with the previous ones. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new model. So it's basically, so it's a new instance of the model that we had specified previously uh, with the, you know, the same learning rate and decay values, um, which I could update here, but I don't want to. I'm just fine. We're going to fit it. And then we're going to see how it does. So what you need to remember is that this new uh, model Kaggle is going to have seen less training data than our previous model. So 
we might expect that it will not do quite as well when it generalizes because it's just it's seen seen less less data and here we go boom let's go plot the history it looks very similar to the of course it's the same type of model it's built from the same description right and now we're going to evaluate it um no but this one we have evaluated on the training because we can't evaluate on the test because the test doesn't have labels um So what we have done though, is we have used, um, so we have used the original training data um, and we still see that our, um, our new Kaggle model that we're going to use is still doing pretty good. It's hundred percent still, it's. Okay. Now, this final one is basically, so um, one of the issues is that, you know, for, for the Kegel, Kegel data set, we don't have the labels, but we can compare our two models, right? We have two model instances, one of them trained on one data set and another trained on a different MS data set, right? Slightly different, but we can run them side by side and then see which what they say, and um, and so we can kind of just look through here to see if there's a disagreement between these two. Um, and it looks like our our model has agreed, our two models agree on, on all the data that it sees here. So let's go and um, and generate our predictions. Okay. So we take our, uh, okay, actually there's predictions for our first model and for the Keg Kaggle model. The, uh, this is the one that's gonna to, to show the difference. Okay, okay. So, um, so, so on this data set, it found the differences between these two models that we created. There's 195 differences that it found on, on, a, on, 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 the, on the test data set or, or, or on the, 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 the training data set. Um, so it's showing 10 of these. So basically, um, uh, the model predicts seven, uh, whereas the Kaggle model predicts four. Kind of see that. Uh, the previous model predicts six. Um, the Kaggle model predicts four. So, um, so again, so you're starting to see the differences between the model that um, had a bit more data to, to train on and, and saw more more examples so you can kind of look through that let's go and export these predictions so the predictions we're going to export um, so it's going to be in, in this format where we basically have the images the, those are the images in the um in the um uh, 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 a te test set that came from kaggle um of course it has the labels as all zero we we have to go and fill them in with um, our predictions from our uh, Kaggle model. And so to do that, we run this, and now we see that our, so we have saved over the submission file, and we now see that we have put our labels in. So this is what we think each of these test images should, should be. And finally, we're going to submit to, to Kaggle. And what you need to do is you need to modify this field again. Again, you know, copy your, um, your username from that JSON file in here and copy the key into here. <clears throat> the, um, you can copy it from the cell above. And I'll let you go and do that. And what I'll just do is I'm going to run mine, which I think was already perfect. Thank okay. you. One new message.
Perfect. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm almost done here. Um, so if you entered in the right username and the right API key, you should be able to submit the, 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 um, the submission CSV that we created up here um, to, to Kaggle. Okay, and what you can do is we can look at this competition and we can look at the, at the leaderboard. And if you're logged in, you should be able to see it. So there's the, there's the, there's the competition. This is your competitions that you're in. So um, yay me, I'm in the digit recognizer competition. And I think I can just go straight there. And what I can do is I can look at the leaderboard for this. And oh, and I can even jump to my position in the leaderboard. So where am I? Ah, there we go. Your first entry. Bum, ba, dum. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm at about 648 place uh, with a score that was evaluated by Kaggle of, of 0.99 correct, which is pretty good. <clears throat> okay, so congratulations. Um, you're now ready to explore you know, deeper into the uh, Keras image classification and also to participate in the, in the ML challenge. A 130, haha, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Cyber's got my back. Okay, so um, yes, so 12 to one, there's a keynote. And um, so at 130, if you're interested in the ML competition, uh, which is uh, the data set will be on house, housing prices instead, and you're gonna try to basically do kind of a linear regression on house prices, um, you'll be able to know how to submit to that competition and um, it, with, your, with your Kaggle account. And um, so with that, <coughs> Um, if there are any other questions or comments, if you could um, uh, maybe uh, mention them now. Okay. <clears throat> and it's 10.30 and... Right on, exactly on time. Perfect, perfect. So um, there we go. So I, I think we'll, we'll call it quits. Um, uh, uh, thanks for attending everyone and I wish you all the best. <laughs>